I did my medical school in Japan. Um, I moved to the United States in 2011. Um, I did my residency and fellowship in Chicago. And then I did my interventional fellowship at the University of Chicago. After that, I did a CTO and complex intervention fellowship at St. Luke's Hospital in Kansas City with Dr. Aaron Grantham. And that was, uh, I finished the fellowship in the end of 2018. And then from January 2019, I have been here at University of Missouri uh, focusing on patients with complex coronary artery disease, including CTOs and uh, high-risk anatomies. We have uh, four cath labs and one hybrid cath lab in the OR. And we do a total about 600 PCIs a year. Um, about that, 130 is a STEMI. We serve as a you know, uh, referral center for the hospitals in mid-Missouri, so we routinely get transferred from an outside hospital. And my personal volume, um, my PCI volume is about 180 cases a year, and um, I have done about 50 to 60 CTOs over the past two, two years. Yes, so my initial experience of robots was during my CTO chip training with Dr. Grantham in 2018. So he was at that time doing um, the CTO cases with the robotic assistants and all the complex two-stand strategies with the robotic assistants too. So I was surprised how much the technology actually can do. And um, um, I definitely felt that uh, you know, our field is gonna go um, this direction. And I definitely felt that we should use our technology um, to improve outcomes for the patients. And I think the robotic PCI has the potential for that. I think there's a couple of things. Obviously, there's um, the fact of like the radiation exposure and um, you know the lead time that the interventional cardiologists have. Um, a lot of interventional cardiologists suffer from orthopedic injury or um, radiation-related medical issues, and so reducing that radiation um, is actually huge. And I, we actually published the data in two cent from two centers. Um, if you do a robotic-assisted CTO-PCI, even after you cross the CTO, if you connect the robot at that time um, and do it in the cockpit, the operator can spend 48% of the case in the cockpit without radiation or lead time. And so I think those will add up and it will help with the longevity of the operator. In addition, um, there is some benefit in terms of precision, like we discussed. You know, the screen is so close to the operator, so you can, you know, exactly where you're going to place the stent. Um, it's also very helpful when treating the osteo lesions um, because of the way that the guide moves um, during the robotic PCI. Yeah, staff is a very um, important part of the procedure because they will be doing the device exchanges and you have to have a good uh, relationship with them to build a strong uh, robotic PCI program. And I'm fortunate here at University of Missouri, you know, my colleagues are supportive, um, staff are enthusiastic, and the cath lab manager and the hospital administrators are supportive. So um, all those things helps when you develop a program. With regards to navigating the robot in the cockpit, it, if you're a good interventionist, know how to do the manual PCI, it'll probably take about four or five cases um, to get comfortable with it. We also learn how to do the exchanges, and that's also important. So exchanges, you have to put the cassette on, do the exchanges, and then know how to end the case. That part, I would say about five to 10 cases before you get comfortable. If you're starting a program, you probably want to start with a little bit easier case so that the staff gets comfortable with all the exchanges. And then you can you know, move on to a harder case as you go. And um, that's what we're doing here at University of Missouri as well. In terms of ergonomics, um, you can sit in the cockpit and um, do the procedure for kind of um, without wearing lead, which really helps because after a long day, you know, sometimes I was having like back stiffness already. I'm still young, but I can still have that. But I realized after a robotic case, I'm not tired at all. So I have full energy. Um, my decision is not impaired um, even after a long case. And so that helps. In terms of the efficiency, I think it's the team dynamics too. Um, you know, you kind of understand what the staff is doing. Staff will understand what you're trying to do. So the teamwork has grown. Um, and also during the exchanges, you have time. So you can actually start putting in some report, look at, you know, uh, review the films more carefully. And so those are the things that you can improve efficiency. 
The first automatic movement was called a, a rotate on retraction, and that's the automated uh, rotation of the wire um, every time you pull back. And uh, I was very comfortable using that, and it helps a lot when you're wiring um, some of the branches or the lesions. Um, the new addition has been um, like spinning motion and wiggling motion, doddering motion, and I've just tried the uh, spinning motion recently in a case yesterday. Um, the wire bent was actually uh, not suitable for the vessel that I was going after, but using that spinning motion, it, was, it went really well. And so I think that was another um, interesting aspect um, in good addition to the program. So yesterday, the ro robotic case that we did was in a patient uh, who came with a non-STEMI, had a three-vessel disease. We ended up fixing LED and the CERC for him. And uh, we uh, wired it with a robot. Uh, we ballooned it, pre-dilated, IVIS it with a robot, measured the lesion length with the balloon, and then, um, um, and then placed the appropriate size stent. Um, after we placed the stent, we needed a second one, so uh, we needed to overlap but we were able to use the clear stent live feature and I feel like we, I could overlap just at like one stent strut. So that will be very helpful um, in terms of the long-term outcome for the patient. So the first case is a 70-year-old gentleman, a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and chronic kidney disease who presented with acute shortness of breath and end STEMI. EKG with ischemic changes anterolaterally and echocardiogram showed ejection fraction of 30% with apical anterior akinesis. This was his baseline coronary angiography, and you can see the left main is intact, but there is significant disease of the LAD, and also there is a disease from the proximal circumflex artery to the OM branch. This is a caudal view. And in the cranial views, you can see the LAD lesion a little better. There is a tandem lesion, 70%, followed by a 90% lesion. The right coronary artery um, was totally occluded um, in the distal RCA. And this is the RAO shot. Mid RCA also has about 70% disease. And so based on this finding and the findings from the echocardiogram, we decided to go after the LAD first. So we have the EBU4 guide uh, seated in the left main, and we started using, uh, started the procedure using the robot. So the first guide wire was uh, our workhorse Minamo guide wire, and our bedside operator usually makes the bend, but this was a little uh, too much bend for uh, uh, LAD. And so we were able to advance through the uh, proximal portion, but could not advance the mid portion. But you can see the spin motion here with the Minamo guide wire. We changed the bend and we used the Cyan Blue guide wire and using the R or R, which is a rotate on, on retract um, feature of the robot, we were able to wire the mid LAD lesion. We advanced the balloon uh, for pre-dilation. Initially, the balloon did not cross the mid-segment, so we used the turbo button that we have in the robot, and with a tur turbo speed, we were able to advance the balloon distally. And you can see the pre-dilation here. The IVIS did not cross, but the, we were able to uh, advance, uh, measure the proximal vessel size. And uh, we performed further dilation with a 2.5 millimeter NC balloon. And here we, because of the, we decided to advance the guideliner for better support. And we delivered the uh, drug eluting stent 3.0 by 28 millimeter into the mid LAD. Now the IVIS was able to cross and we were able to see the well opposed stent. And we were putting the second stent, and here we can see that using the clear stent live feature, we can overlap the stent very well uh, with only one or two stent uh, strut overlap. Post dilation was performed with the 3.5 NC balloon up to 20 atmosphere, and again using the clear stent live feature. So this is the final result of the LAD, and we decided to go after the circumflex artery. 
So here, uh, keeping the uh, cyan blue guide wire in the LED, we used the Minamo guide wire that we used, and the band was perfect for the left circumflex RE, so we were able to wire this robotically. And then here's a pre-dilation. Again, IBIS is performed. This time, the lesion length was measured by the IBIS pullback using the constant speed feature. And this is the uh, stent going up. Post dilation with 3.5 NC balloon up to 20 atmosphere using a clear stent live feature. And these were the final results of the LAD and LF circumflex artery. You can see the collaterals going into the RCA territory. You can see the PL branch is a fairly large branch. Initially, our plan was to stage the RCA as an outpatient, but offline analysis showed that the RCA could be uh, subacute, and therefore we brought him back for a staged PCI to the RCA the following day. So here we're using a six French AL guide catheter and we're using the Cyan Blue guide wire. And we're wiring this again robotically using the spinning motion. And then a ROR motion. After confirming the position at the proximal cap, the guide wire did not advance um, with itself, and therefore we actually advanced the balloon for uh, better support robotically as well. And here we were using the new spinning motion. Then we also use the constant speed. And in this case, the wiggle technique seems to uh, make a little more progress. And after switching to ROR technique, uh, we were able to wire through that lesion. After the lesion crossing, uh, we actually uh, uh, did the pre-dilation with the balloon. And here's the technique where you can seat the guide robotically. So with the balloon up, um, I'm pulling the balloon back with a joystick, and that will automatically seat the guide into the, into the vessel. So despite the good guide position, the balloon did not advance easily. So we, were, we used a technique called doddering technique, and this uh, advanced the balloon nicely. So after this, we did a further pre-dilation. And IBIS examination to uh, decide the size. The guide wire was pulled by the assisting operator during the exchange, but we were able to su successfully recover that robotically as well. So the first drug draining stent was placed at distal RCA, and now we're pre-dilating the mid segment. And here we use the robotic lesion measurement using the distal marker by marking the distal landing zone and the proximal landing zone, and that gave us a 26 millimeter lesion length, and so we put a 275 by 28 millimeter drug draining stent. So again, we performed a post dilation with the NC balloon with a clear stent live feature. And this was uh, uh, done with a contrast of 55 cc, uh, 0 0.9 grade radiation. And I was able to sit in the control room the entire case. And this was the final result. This was a case of a three vessel PCI using the robotic system and artist icona system. So this is uh, our typical setting for the when we're doing the robotic PCI. You can see this is the cockpit in the control room. You have the same screen that you see in front of you in the cath lab. And you can move the device with these three uh, joysticks. So this is for the balloon, this is for the guide wire, and also for the guide catheter. You should have a, a good team um, that's, that who are in, you know, interested and enthusiastic. Um, you should probably have some good support from your colleagues and um, your uh, hospital uh, administrators. But, all, but the most important thing is that the doctor who's performing that um, actually is very enthusiastic and believes in the future. 
Yeah, so we were looking for a you know, angiogram machine that's uh, user-friendly, uh, low radiation with uh, good visualization. And I think a kind of fit um, all of the aspects. And so that's why we got that machine. Um, so far, I've been very happy with the performance. Um, the radiation dose has been lower, and we've seen a lot of good cases where um, it actually helped the patients because of the good visualization. So some of the things that I realized is a steeper angle is very easy to make. And so, especially when you're doing a left main case, it's always a balance between how much steep you can go uh, versus you know, compromise of the visualization because you have to go to the tissue plane. That has been very easy and we can get the you know, actual angle that we want. And so that's been very, very helpful. In general, as you know, the radiation dose is going to be higher in those population, but still um, we can have a reasonable radiation and we can have a good visualization. So I've been happy with that as well. We worked with uh, technic tec uh, technicians and engineers from Siemens uh, well. I think what I liked about is they kind of optimized um, the, into the flavors that we like the most. And that has helped, especially um, it, because as a CTO operator, we always use a lower floor dose with a 7.5 frame rate. And we sometimes get compromised the image, you know, we just get used to it. But I realized with the artist Icono system, um, I can actually see the guide wire very well, even with a low frame rate. I think the uh, procedure time got better because we can get good quality image um, and we can overlap the scent, like I said, um, in much easier than before. So the procedure has become more efficient. In terms of the turnaround time, I like the C-arm is very easy to move and then the control board is very easy to turn, put it on and off. And so that has helped with the turnover. I also realized that because of the footprint of the machine is so small, the rooms appear to be a little more spacier to me. And because we do a lot of complex cases um, using other equipments too, I think that helps too. So in our lab, mostly in terms of um, the panning, um, we do as a physician. Um, but sometimes when the techs are in with us, supporting our case, then the techs might do it. Another nice thing about the artist iconos in, in our system is that we have the same control board in the control room too. So when I'm in the control room using the robot or when I'm just supervising the fellow from the control room, um, I can actually adjust the II a little bit from outside and um, help them out a little bit. Today, I would like to share a complex case that highlights the use of artist icono system. This is a 76-year-old female with history of hypertension and coronary artery disease status post-bypass in 1990s, diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, chronic kidney disease, stage 5. Her baseline creatinine is about 4.5 and EGFR was 10. She presented to our hospital with dizziness and developed typical angina and diagnosed with non-STEMI. She was initially hesitant for going for a coronary angiography given her creatinine and the risk of dialysis, but the angina did not resolve with initial medical therapy and we could not control even with a nitroglycerin drip. Troponin continued to rise and therefore she underwent coronary angiography. This is her baseline and angiogram and you can see there is a severely calcified RCA with a proximal um, 80 to 90 percent disease and the distal PL branch appears to be occluded. The vein graft that used to supply the RCA was totally occluded. This is the left system and you can see the LAD is a chronic a total occlusion at the proximal portion. The diagonal branch has a severe disease and an osteo left circumflex as well as the mid left circumflex has severely calcified disease as well. This is another view of the left system. Here's a picture of the lima. Lima was widely patent, but we realized that it was actually grafted into the diagonal branch. LAD fills very faintly, um, likely from the left-to-left -left collateral or the retrofilling from the diagonal branch. You can also see uh, collaterals to the right system via the septal branches, and you can see the PL branch is a fairly large vessel. So these were her findings. 
and she has a distal left main to osteo left circumflex with 90% disease. She has a LAD CTO after the diagonal takeoff, the first diagonal with a diffuse disease, mid left circumflex with 90% disease, osteo RCA with 80% disease, and distal PL branch with a total occlusion. We couldn't tell if this was chronic or subacute. The graft lima touches down to the diagonal with a faint left to left collateral to the LAD, and the vein grafts were occluded, and the EDP was 18 millimeters of mercury. She underwent temporary dialysis and fluid removal in preparation for her staged PCI. So, our plan was to perform a PCI to the distal RCA and a PL branch, the PCI to the mid left circumflex, and provisional stenting into the left main osteo left circumflex but keep the, uh, do a kissing balloon inflation to open the stent struts in case she needs CTO PCI to the LAD in the future. So we started from the right here and you have a JR guide and uh, using a Corsair 135 centimeter, we have a workhorse wire and the total occlusion was able to be crossed with the Pilot 200 guide wire. After uh, exchanging into a back to the workhorse wire, we uh, uh, advanced the balloon with the guideliner support, and we were able to perform a balloon angioplasty to the PL branch. Because of the proximal lesion, when we advanced the guideliner, she became um, very ischemic, and so we did this part very quickly. Um, by IVIS examination, we show circumferential car calcium, and therefore uh, we decided to treat the proximal RCA first, and after further dilation with 2.5 millimeter cutting balloon, we performed a PCI with a 3.0 by 20 millimeter jaguarine stent, which was post dilated with a 3.5 NC balloon and an osteoflash balloon. After this, we performed further angioplasty of the PL branch with a 3.5 millimeter balloon, and we left the RCA here with a good flow to the PL branch as well. Next, we went to the left system, and this is a pre-dilation of the left vein to the osteo left circumflex artery. Uh, we did the IVIS examination, and because it was uh, severely calcified as well, we did the pre-dilation using the a cutting balloon and we performed PCI with a uh, 3.0 by 24 millimeter drug eluting stent distally, and another one proximally to, from the left main into the circumflex artery. We performed POT with a 4.0 NC balloon, and after recross, we actually wired into the diagonal branch, and with this wire, uh, we performed a balloon angioplasty of the diagonal branch and performed a kissing balloon to open the stent strut. So the final part here, uh, we did it with a 4.0 NC balloon using the click clear stent live feature. And you can see the good quality images even in the uh, spider shot. And you can see that um, I can land the balloon right at the ostium of the stent. So this was the final angiogram. And uh, this was 100 CT of contrast with 1.8 gray uh, radiation. So her hospital course, um, her chest pain actually resolved after the procedure. She had a good urine output and did not require further dialysis. And she was discharged the following day with a close follow-up. Here, I presented a case that highlights the use of artist icono system with good visualization with a steep angle such as spider shot. We have this uh, you know, artist icono system and we have the um, automated injection and the robotic arm. And this is our, uh, how the, our cath lab is set. And we've been very happy with the performance of the artist icono system in terms of the radiation dose, um, you know, good image quality and easy uh, user-friendliness.